Good morning, church. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I hope it is well with your souls today. I want to remind you that next week we will not be here, but at 10 o'clock we're having a combined service down in the Celebration Center as we launch some new vision and and we learn about who we are and what we do here. Um, So I encourage you to come out. There will um, be there will be children's uh, church and nursery during that time and uh, Sunday school is going to be up to the teachers whether they want to have it and where they want to have it but next week 10 o'clock combined service downstairs in the celebration center please come out it's going to be a good day Um, and we are starting accepting if, if you've been watching the news at all you know that there's a lot of flooding down in Florida or Kentucky And so UMCOR and the United Methodist Church are looking to to move in there to help the the victims of the flooding. And we're taking up love offerings to send to UMCOR. If you feel called by God, you want to help with that, fill out the red and white uh, envelopes and mark check UMCOR and write Kentucky next to it and put it in the offering plates. We are also starting um, next Sunday... Through the end of September, we're collecting socks. And these socks will go to help the St. John Newman Parish in Williamsport with their ministry of providing socks and shoes to those who are experiencing homelessness. So if you want to buy some socks, um, bring them in till the end of September. Um, Also, last week we had... um, Elisa Lidecker come up and she spoke to you and she thanked you for the support that you gave her for this past year and, and we celebrated what she's done in, in uh, uh, raising up our children's program from, from foundation to now over 50 kids in the program and so we, we celebrate that. Uh, we weren't able to do it last week but uh, this week we want to introduce you to our new children's ministry workers, uh, staff members, and they're in the back there. They're going to come up here real quick. And it's Kylie Nearswicky and Tiffany Rarick. So would you uh, welcome them? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And uh, uh, I think they're going to just say a, a brief something or other. Hi, I'm Kylie Nearswicky. This is Tiffany. Um, We'll be taking over Lisa's place, kind of splitting the work together. We just want to thank you for our warm welcome, and we're excited to get to work with everybody and get to know some more people. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. We just wanted to have put, put a face in front of you so you know who they are, so you can uh, continue to pray for them, support them like you did, Lisa. And I'm excited about uh, some of the things that in talking with them, how they're going to continue the program and continue to build it. So uh, when you see them, don't be afraid to talk to them and support them. All right? My friends, let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Will you stand and join me in the call to worship, please? Invisible God only wise. Let's pray the prayer of the day, followed by some silent moments uh, and prayers of confession. Glorious God, whose voice whispers our names and calls us from our slumber, forgive us the things we should not have done yet did, as well as the things we should have done but did not. O oh Lord, gather us now in your triune spirit and prepare us for worship and ministry. Amen. Our loving and merciful God will cause light to shine out of our darkness 
and to shine in our hearts, cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Don't neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the time to consider what you are doing or could be doing that would please God. Let us pray. Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work 
and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. Amen. You may be seated. You know, as I was getting ready this morning, I knew what my sermon was, and I knew the closing song, and so I thought, I'm going to wear my Amazing Grace tie. And having worn this, I'm like, okay, now I need to wear the blue shirt. And that means I need to wear my blue slacks. You know, it's all coordinated and stuff. And, and so I thought about, probably like you did getting ready this morning, does everything match? Am I put together? But the one thing I didn't think about was the other stuff that I wear. That dirt that I got into yesterday. And I don't mean the soil of the earth. I mean the things that I shouldn't have been looking at, the things I shouldn't have been thinking, the things that I shouldn't have said, the the things I participated in. We wear that too. And yet God accepts us into his presence and he calls us to come into his presence just as we are, just as we are. Now, he doesn't want us to stay that way, but in his presence, he can wash us clean He can wash that dirt from us. He can wash those things we got into from us and make us better, make us more like him. And so as we prepare to come to the Lord in prayer, come freely and join me in singing Just As I Am. Gracious God, it is into your presence that we come. And Lord, we come as we are. Oh, we can try to dress ourselves up and and make ourselves look pretty, but you see beneath that. And Lord, there are things in our lives that aren't so pretty. And yet you don't lock the door and say, stay out. You don't bar us from coming in saying, you're not allowed. You don't say, go and fix yourself up better and then come back. No, you receive us just as we are. And we are so grateful. And Lord, in your presence, we can be made better. We can be made clean. And Lord, we pray that you help us in that. Lord, help us to overcome the weaknesses in our life that tempt us to do the things that we know we shouldn't. And Lord, help us to get rid of the fears in our lives that that don't allow us to do the things that we know that we should. Lord, in your presence we come this morning 
with joy and knowing that we are accepted, even with our faults. But help us not to stay in those faults, but help us to overcome them. Lord, this morning we also pray for those who are in need of your healing. We pray for Dave Wallace. Lord, we pray for um, Arlene Opp. We pray, pray for Leona DeWalt. Lord, we pray for just those who are in, in the hospital right now, those who are sick at home. Lord, we pray for those who grieve. We pray for Linda Geis and her family. Lord, Harold was a big part of our, their family. He was a big part of our church, and now there's that hole that is where he once was. And no one's just going to come in and fill that hole. But Lord, you can. And so be with them and, and love them. Show your compassion. Give them comfort and your grace and your mercy in this time. Lord, we thank you for all that Harold has meant to us. And we know that he is celebrating with you, Lord. And so walk with us now. Lord, we also pray for our church that you continue to help us to grow. Bless our children, our youth. Bless, bless our, our ministries that we do and the classes that we have. Help us to build the kingdom further. And Lord, we pray for our country that seems so divided on many, many you know, avenues. And I pray that your prayer in the garden, that we would be one, united, as you and the Father, I pray that that prayer would come to pass. We don't have to like one another. We don't have to agree with one another. But can we be civil to one another and listen? Can we, can we come together and, and love one another, even in our differences? that we still can be united. Lord, we pray for your United Methodist Church as well and the division that seems to be happening there. Lord, it is sad when a church is divided against itself. But that seems to be where we've found ourselves. So help us to find that way forward, Lord, and, and, and not to demonize or villainize the other side but help us Lord to see our brothers and sisters across the way we pray that one day we will we will reunite in you so in all of these things this morning Lord hear our prayers thank you for inviting us into your presence as we are this we ask in the name of Jesus our healer and savior amen Let the children 
stood beneath the cross of Calvary and gazed on your face at the thorns of oppression and the wounds of disgrace. For surely you have borne our suffering and carried our grief as you fought and showed grace to the thief. What boundless love, what fathomless grace you have shown us, O God of compassion. Each day we live and offer Will you pray with me? Holy God, open our minds to the truth of your word. Enable us to hear your voice speaking to our hearts and open our eyes to see Jesus on every page. Amen. The Old Testament reading is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up to and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant." 
The New Testament reading is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg not to, that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and very quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he had laid hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which to work, ought, and you ought, that work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead them away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said this, all the, his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Before I get started, I just want to say that I forgot to mention Janice Easton and Ginny Boob in my prayer time, so please keep them in your prayers. In our gospel lesson today, we find Jesus teaching in the synagogue, and we're not told what he's teaching about, but whatever it was, it wasn't the important thing, because uh, he's going to teach us something about the law here in just a second. There were many different people gathered around from religious leaders to just the, the local yokels in the town. And one of those people was a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. Now, we don't know anything about her. We don't even know her name. All we know that she has been crippled for 18 years. And apparently, her impairment is the work of a spirit or a demon. Or at least that's what the people were saying. But Jesus saw her in the crowd, and out of an Im immense love, he has compassion for her, and he calls her forward. And he says, woman, 
you are set free from your infirmity. Now notice, he, di he didn't say, what would you like me to do for you? He didn't say, do you have faith? He didn't ask her. All he said was, I am setting you free. You are healed from your infirmity. And then he touched her, and immediately she stood up and began praising God. Now you would think that those witnessing this miracle would be astounded, perhaps overjoyed and praise God. But the leading rabbi of the synagogue was so hard-hearted that and legalistic that he doesn't, he doesn't care who the woman is. He doesn't care what's wrong with her. He doesn't care that, that you know, um, she is healed or that a miracle took place. The only thing he cares about is that it happened on the Sabbath. You may recall in Exodus 20, God gave the Ten Commandments, the law to the Israelites, and the fourth commandment was, you shall keep the Sabbath holy. God said, six days you shall labor and, on, and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work. Healing was considered work for a physician. It was part of their profession, and therefore it was prohibited on the Sabbath. Thus the rabbi says, look, there are six days for doing you know, your work and being healed, but don't, don't do it this day. Come back the next the religious leader's argument seems reasonable, and it, it, it's true to the scriptures. I mean, she's been crippled for 18 years. What's one more day going to matter? Come back tomorrow. But you see, it wasn't an issue of the healing, and it wasn't really an issue of what day it was taking place. The problem is that this man who is supposed to be a shepherd of God's people, a man who's supposed to show God's love and compassion, a man who's supposed to be raising people up and comforting them, he shows no compassion for this woman. There's no pastoral quality from him toward her. He only sees the law. And Jesus is incensed by the religious leader's statement. He says, you hypocrites! Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox and take them out to get a, a, a drink of water? So shouldn't this woman who's created in the image of God, a daughter of Abraham, shouldn't she be unbound from, from this infirmity? Obviously, there were certain things that could be done on a, on a, on a you know, needed to be done on a daily basis. You know, if you didn't feed and water your animals, if you didn't milk the cows, if you didn't, you know, get the eggs from the chickens, you're going to lose out. The animals are going to suffer. And there's, you know, if a shepherd lost a sheep or it got harmed, they were able to bind it up and take care of its wound and, and rescue it. And there's even evidence from other writings that religious leaders did help the sick on the Sabbath. And so not everything was prohibited. And they knew that. And here Jesus shames them by pointing out their hypocrisy. They would show compassion to an animal and release it and care for it, but they would not show and care or show compassion and care for a human being. And now they won't even rejoice in the fact that this person is released from Satan's bondage. The religious leaders were more concerned with the law than they were with people, but Jesus is more concerned with people than he is for the law. He's willing to set the law aside if it will reconcile a person. And so he unties this woman. He sets her free from her disability so that she could be the person that God had created her to be. In their humiliation, the religious leaders hardened their hearts and they even set out to make a plan to destroy Jesus. After witnessing this miracle, they didn't change and they didn't stop focusing on their legalistic ways. Forty years later, the author of the book of Hebrews finds himself addressing legalism as well and the law and what that law means and, and how we've been, you know, what it doesn't mean. In Luke's passage, we saw the contrast between Jesus and his compassion and concern for people and the religious leader's lack of compassion and concern for the law. 
In Hebrews, we see the contrast between the people's old terrified approach to Mount Sinai and their new joyful approach to Mount Zion. So let's look at that again in verses 18 to 21 of Hebrews 12. He says, You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, the sound of trumpet blast, a voice whose words made the, the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, that even if an animal touched the base of a mountain, they should be put to death by stoning. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Mount Sinai is a mountain where God made his covenant with his people, uh, the Israelites, after life in Egypt. It was the place where he laid down the law, gave them the Ten Commandments that then the religious leaders piled on. When God revealed himself on Mount Sinai, he did so as thunder and lightning and thick clouds and a loud trumpet blast. Sinai was usually wrapped in a shroud of smoke because God came upon it in fire and the whole mountain would quake. All of these things caused the people to tremble with fear. In Exodus 19, 12 and 13, God instructed Moses to set up a safety boundary around the mountain. Because if a person or even an animal touched it, they were to be stoned to death. And it was commands like this that caused the people to beg Moses, saying, don't tell us anymore. We can't stand this. Oh, it just fills us with stress and anxiety. What if we do this? What if we do that? When everything was driven by the law, there was fear and anxiety in contrast, the author of Hebrews describes Mount Zion this way. You have not come to a mountain that you can't touch, but you have come to a mountain, the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, where innumerable angels gather in festal gatherings for worship. Mount Zion was Jerusalem. It was located, or in, Mount Zion was located where Jerusalem was and the temple was built. God was said to live on Mount Zion and dwell in the tabernacle. And it would, want, it would eventually be called the city of David. But did you catch the contrast that the author is, is bringing forth? Mount Sinai was filled with darkness and gloom and storms and fire and loud clashes of thunder and tempest. And the people feared it. However, Mount Zion was compared to heaven, filled with a myriad of, of angels joyfully gathering in worship. It was a place of joy and hope and love, and the people felt safe and protected. Now, both Mount Sinai and Mount Zion was a place where God resided. So what was the difference between the two? The author, author of Hebrews says the difference is Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. The old covenant was based on the law. And if you broke it, if you, if you stepped over it, if you, you didn't do this or you did that, you would be punished because the law said so. That's the covenant. But the new covenant was made in the blood of the Lamb. And it freed us from the law. Before Jesus, God seemed distant and threatening because of the law. And the people were bound to the law. The law was hard. The law was frightening. But Jesus set us free from the law. At Sinai, the only one allowed to touch the mountain was Moses, their high priest. And then God told Moses to call the Levites together. And the Levites became the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. And they were the priest. And every year they would, they would choose one high priest. And once a year, he would go into the into the temple, and he would offer sacrifice in the Holy of Holies for the people's sin. At Sinai, a cloud separated Moses, the high priest, from God and protected him. And in the temple, it was the temple veil that protected the high priest from God. But Jesus is now our new high priest, and when he died on the cross, he tore the temple veil in two, giving us access to God untying us from the law. 
We no longer have to fear coming before God, for we are free to approach God with joy and hope. Jesus told the woman, you are free. He untied her from her spiritual bondage. And Jesus says to us, I have untied you. Through faith in me, you are free of the law. It doesn't mean we don't need to try to follow it and be obedient to it. It just means we're free from the damnation that comes when we don't follow it, when we mess up, when we backslide. We are free from the fear of damnation to the law. And so Jesus says, you're free of it. So go and be who God has chosen you to be. You know, sometimes we, we are bound and tied up by Satan and the oppression that he, he puts on top of us, as the woman in Luke was. But God can untie us, he can heal us, he can set us free. Sometimes we get chained by our addictions or our disabilities or our finances or our illnesses, our shame, our guilt of things we've done in the past. Sometimes we get tangled up in legalism and the law and rules and regulations and even church tradition. And we say, well, we've always done it this way. We use them as excuses to rationalize away our obligation to help one another or to start things as reasons not to change and not reach new people. The Pharisees were masters at this because they had so many purification laws Almost any ministry they did to the common or for the common person would cause them to become unclean. Perfect example of this is the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there was a man who had been beaten and left along the side of the road. He's lying in the dirt. He's covered in blood. And two religious leaders, a Levite and a priest, come by and they made a wide berth around him. Because if they touched him, if they helped him, they would become unclean for seven days and they'd have to go through these purification rituals and we don't have time for that. We don't want to be seen as unclean. We do this as well as humans. We all at times rationalize away or try to our responsibility to do things because we're afraid or we're afraid of what people will think or we just don't want to do it. And that was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet at a very young age, um, but unknown to Jeremiah was that God appointed him to be a prophet before he was even conceived. You see, God had a purpose for Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah would have known what a prophet was and what it meant to be a prophet. He knew that no one liked a prophet. No one wanted to see a prophet coming into town. He knew that they would get chased out. They would get spit upon. He knew they would get yelled at. They would be threatened. He knew it would also probably mean a life of isolation and sorrow. And this probably frightened him. I know for myself accepting my call to ministry, there were things that I was afraid of and that I didn't want to do, and so I fought my call. I understand Jeremiah not wanting to take on this responsibility. And so he replies saying, Sovereign Lord, I, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. Now, when you hear that, how old do you think he must be? I mean, most scholars put him in his mid-20s at this point. He's not a child. He's not a teenager. He's a young man. But he's a frightened young man who's not sure he wants to step in and do this job. And so he makes this excuse. But God, the God who knew him before he was born, wasn't buying it. And he tells him, no, you're going to go where I send you, and you're going to tell the people what I want you to say. God said, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you. God called Jeremiah. God commanded Jeremiah. God was with Jeremiah, and he promised Jeremiah that he would rescue him. Now it's up to Jeremiah to believe that, to shake off the ropes and the chains that had bound him, the things that wrapped him in fear. Shake that off and go. Like Jeremiah, when God created the universe, he looked out over time, and he saw each one of us. 
and he knew each of us intimately before we were ever born. And he has a plan for me, he has a plan for you. For some of us, it's a very specific task. For Jeremiah, he was called to be a prophet. Samson, a judge. David, a king. Paul, an apostle. Billy Graham, an evangelist. Me, a preacher. You, I don't know. What, what has God called you to do, called you to be? If you've been given a specific call, then seek to fulfill the mission. But if you haven't, then fulfill the mission of all believers to love and serve one another and God with the gifts and talents that God has given you. Help build his kingdom. You know, often we struggle or fear doing new things, new ministries, because we lack confidence or we feel we don't have enough experience or knowledge or education. We get tied up in guilt and shame of our past, you know, the past things we've done. But so did Moses and Paul and even Matthew. And yet they overcame that. They were untied and they did great things. We allow our illnesses or our disabilities to, to be excuses for not doing things. We say we're too old, we're too young. Jeremiah said he was only a child, a young boy. But God doesn't accept our excuses because it doesn't matter what we are or who we are. It, what matters is what God is going to do with us. If God calls you to do a job, he's also going to provide you with the means of doing it. But many times we make excuses because we're afraid of what other people, our friends, our family might think. We allow this fear to tie us up in knots. But God told Jeremiah, do not be afraid. For I am with you, and I will rescue you. And there's, did you catch that, though? There's something at the end of that, what God told him, that's so easy for us to overlook. God said, I will rescue you. You see, God never promised Jeremiah there wouldn't be trouble. He never promised him there wouldn't be hard times. But he did say, I will be with you, and I will rescue you. God allows us to experience the storms of life but he sees us through. As a matter of fact, he endures it with us. Friends, there are many, many ministry opportunities out there. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I wonder, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to be? If you know, I encourage you to allow Christ to set you free from whatever is tying you up, whatever is holding you back from doing what God is calling you to do. And if you don't know, you truly don't know where you might be able to fit in, then I encourage you, come next week to our combined service. Talk with the ministry teams and see what they do and how you might fit in. Allow Christ to set you free from whatever fears you have. Run into God's presence. Embrace him and his calling for you, for he will be with you. We no longer need to fear the Lord's presence like they did on Mount Sinai because of the law, but we can joyfully abound in it because Jesus Christ is our mediator. He is our savior of the new covenant, a covenant not in the law, but in the blood of the Lamb. And he has freed us from our bondage to sin and to the fear that holds us back. So let us rejoice in our freedom and share it with all we meet. Choose this day whom you will serve. And my friends, be free to be all that God has created you to be. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful for your word today. Lord, it is so easy for us to get caught up and forget that you are with us. Lord, we, we think that maybe you've walked away from us at times, and there are things that cause us fear. And I'm pretty sure each and every one of us know that you're pulling us towards something to do something. And we ask that you would set us free from our fears, whether it's the fear of not having enough time in life, the fear of finances that might, you know, hey, that's going to cost me money. Or the fear of not knowing all the answers. Or the fear of 
not being sure where this is going to lead. Lord, whatever it is that, that holds us back, set us free that we can be who you created us to be. And we help us to remember that you will rescue us, that you will put words in our mouths when we don't know what to say. Lord, you will give us directions when we don't quite know where to go. Lord, if we give up time for you and money for you, you will pay us back for that. You will never leave us in our need. And so we pray this morning that we hear your word and understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and join me in our closing hymn that fits right in with this message this morning. Amazing grace, and you guessed it, my chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My change are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy
Almighty God, be with us as we leave here today. Take our fruit of that we produce. May it build your kingdom. And Lord, in that fruit, may we see your promises. And may we let the ropes and the chains that hold us back, the fears, Lord, may they be dropped, for you have set us free. Amen. My friends, go in peace and lovingly serve one another.